Well, let's see. About 12 hours from maybe 24 hours and one week from now, we get to start the construction on the platform. Amen? Amen. And so uh, pray for them, and uh, I can't wait uh, to be able to walk across uh, this platform without the yeah, I feel like I'm walking on water. Can we start that rumor that the pastor's walking on water because we got waves on the platform? Now, nobody's going to believe that that knows me, so uh, I'm just kidding with you. I hope you understand that. Let me ask you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Ha- have you thought about time? It's really an interesting subject. All through the Bible, there's the word time mentioned. Uh, we, we find time uh, throughout, and we'll refer more to it later. But then there comes a time in Revelation when God says, I create all things new. I make all things new. And so we are captive to time. We do so much on time. We have little ringers on our phones to remind us of things. We have watches, and uh, I've, I've watched a lot of people, and I don't have one of those iPhone watches. A lot of people do. I'm not critical, but I've watched a colleague that I worked with for a number of years that we would be at lunch, we would be having a meeting, we would be something else, and he would look at his watch, And then he would pick up his cell phone and go outside and take his call. And I always wondered, why do you need two instruments to tell you you got one call? And yet I know there's so many features on those phones. Time. We're bound to time. We start on time. I'm always excited. I want us to start on time. And the reason I want us to start on time, I really don't care. Uh, whether we start on time or not for time's sake, but when it comes time to get out and the end of my sermon, you're sitting there doing this, thinking I'm getting hungry, you know, because our bodies are hardwired, right? We're creatures of habit. Every single one of us are. And, And so there is time, but God is timeless. He is above time. He is above space, and He is the eternal present tense. Now, in this passage in Romans, I titled the message, Today is Not Tomorrow. Uh, A lot of us remember yesterdays, and sometimes we remember them with sadness. Sometimes we remember them with gladness. Sometimes in our yesterdays, there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. I mean, let's just face it. It wasn't stuff we did. It wasn't because we did it. It It's the kind of world we live in. In fact, I may get into that in a few weeks. I'm seriously considering for our next round uh, after Lance finishes his uh, lessons and we get through the Christmas season sometime the first of the year on Wednesday night just dealing with origins, maybe the first 11 chapters of Genesis. There's a lot packed in those chapters. How did we get like we are? What happened to the simple answer is Adam and Eve's sin, but it's far more complex than that. There was time that was the creation of God. But God himself is timeless. That's why when Moses uh, met him at the burning bush and wanted to know, who are you? And God said, I am. I'm the eternal present. There's no such thing as past tense, present tense, future tense with God. He is eternally present. And so it is out of that that we come to this passage in chapter 8 of Romans, and I want to read it to you, and I want to, uh, there's some heavy stuff in here, and there's far more in Romans 8 than I'm going to get through in the time allotted me. But in verse 28, and I went back, I'm reading from the old translation, and by the way, let me just say something about interpretation of Scripture as far back as you can to the Greek and the Hebrew word meanings you need to go. You cannot translate totally and total 100% understanding from one language to the other. It's impossible. 
There are always different words we use in English that have different meanings to us than they did to the Greeks and to the Hebrews. So let me recommend a tool for you, Young's Analytical Bible Concordance. If you really want to understand Scripture, get you a Young's Analytical Concordance because every word in Scripture, it has every place in the Bible that word is used and how that word is used. So that's important. And in our Bible translations, we have uh, almost everything actually came out of the majority text that the King James has translated from. But uh, if you want to follow the line of the King James translators today, you have the King James Version, then you have the New King James Version. Arthur Farstad was the prime mover in that translation, and uh, it's a good translation. It takes out a lot of the these and the thous and the hard words, and then... Coming down when uh, Holman Christian Standard that we read earlier, when the publishers started to translate that, Arthur Farstad again had worked on with new discoveries. Those new discoveries are new manuscripts, new meanings of words, things like that, that help us understand more what the original Greek text meant, what the original Hebrew text meant. And so Arthur Farstad had about 90% of what we know of as the Holman Christian Bible translated and brought in about 89 or so other translators to review his work and things of that nature. And then later Holman was dropped and now we have the Christian Standard Bible. And so all of those are there as well as other translations. I'm not critical of any of them. There's some that I would avoid. Call me if you want to know the answer to that. I don't want to waste preaching time being negative. But in verse 28 of Romans, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called, and whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified." What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And that is the first verse of next week's message. And we'll try to deal with these today. But I want you to see some things in this passage. And the first thing that I want us to understand, uh, and it's right there in verse 28, it says, and we know. And we know. That word know is oida. It means to understand. We understand. And we understand, and Paul is writing to these Romans, and he's summarizing, coming into chapter 8, talking about security and things of that nature, but he uses this word no, oida in the Greek text, four times in this passage in verse 22. He said, for we know the whole creation groans. In other words, we understand what's happening in creation. We understand all of this groaning. We understand all of these things. And he likens it to a woman having childbirth. He says, we understand. We understand when there's a hurricane. We understand this past week has been horrible. If you've looked at the multiple thousands of people that have been killed in the Moroccan earthquake and the Libyan flood, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that boggles our mind. We're horrified when we have a disaster and four, five, or six are killed, and we should be horrified. Any loss of life is tragic, no matter who it is, because all human beings are made in the the image of God. But over there, thousands upon thousands upon thousands have perished this last week and we don't know how many of them knew the Lord Jesus we don't know how many of them did not know the Lord Jesus creation groans Uh, verse uh, 26 the word know is used again we know The Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for. In other words, often we don't even know how to pray. We don't understand how to pray. Have you had instances in your life when you sincerely wanted to pray, but you really didn't understand how to pray? What do I say? What do I ask for? The Spirit helps us. And then he goes on uh, in the next verse, and 
It says in verse 27, he that searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. And so uh, God who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He understands what the Spirit is doing. And when I last spoke, we spoke in those verses, so I'll not go back and do that. But the Bible is telling us here that we understand that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And what I want you to see and follow me in this, because this is really a mystery to theologians. When you talk about divine election, it's all over the map. That's where we get the idea of the Calvinists versus the Arminians. And I would encourage you, don't Say I'm a Calvinist because you've read the results of the Council of Dort. If you think you're a Calvinist, go back and read John Calvin's Institutes, Volume 1, Volume 2. And it's a good read. It's a long read. He was a French theologian, and they didn't, they didn't talk like we talk. And you and I tell the folks the cows have gotten into the corn. They'd say, well, the cows went down this certain road, and, and they saw this fence down, and they went through the fence, yada, yada, yada. They're very wordy, but you have to go to the source to really understand something. If you think you're an Arminian, you need to study James Arminius' theology. Some of it you'll agree with, and some of it you'll say, What? But see, what happens to us, we often don't go to the source and let Scripture speak for Scripture and let Scripture speak in its entire context, but we go to our favorite authors and we get ourselves in the weeds because of our Western individualism. Almost all of the rest of the world is more corporate. The Bible was written in the East by Eastern thought and not, not this cultic Eastern thought. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the culture of Israel, the culture of that part of the world and those apostles and the Greeks and things of that nature. And their thought process was more corporate than it was individual. And so what is Paul saying to us? He, he is affirming in assuring us in this 8th chapter of Romans that if you know Christ, you have been chosen by God. And he talks about election, predestination. And he talks about it not from the sense of salvation in that God sat somewhere in eternity past and he looked out into his mind as to what would be in the future and said, you and you and you and you are going to heaven and the rest of you... That wasn't the way it happened. Didn't happen that way at all. The Bible tells us, gives us great assurance and great insight that we are chosen by God. And this particular passage is about sanctification. And I'll read it and talk more about it. But he says in verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, there's such richness in these verses that I I want us to try to bring them out here. Uh, When you talk about foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of God, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 also speaks to that, as well as one of the verses we read earlier. And 1 Peter 1, 2 says, elect or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Wow. What if you got a letter like that? This great religious figure wrote you a letter and said grace and peace. Wouldn't that encourage you? 
That's why Peter was writing. That's why Paul is writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about God's purpose in chapter 9 of Romans, verse 11. He talks about his purpose for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, according to choice, might stand, not of works, but of him who calleth. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, those verses, uh, uh, verse 11, I'm going to read, but we read those same things just a few moments ago. It says in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We are chosen. We are foreordained by the foreknowledge of God, and I'll get into that in a moment, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now it gets better. It gets better. Follow me. He talks about purpose, but he talks about God's redemptive plan as we walk through this. Foreknowledge just simply means before. God knew before. Well, let's look at it for a moment. If he's God... He has to have foreknowledge because he's omniscient. Now, the devil is not. I'm not. You're not. No one else is. Only God is all-knowing. Now, think of it. God is not bound by time and space. He is the eternal I am. Everything is present tense to God. And he has all knowledge, all foreknowledge. He knows beforehand. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what he's going to do. He knows about us. He saw us from the foundation of the earth. And Genesis chapter 1 that talks about creation says, In the beginning, God. Now, I sometimes tell folks, let's just put a period there for a little bit. It goes on to say, In the beginning, God created And in our generation, we've had these debates on theology and everything else in our school systems and everything about creation. And those were good debates, and we have to have those. And we affirm the biblical teaching on creation God created. But I want to tell you, in today's world, in today's generation, we need to take that back a step. The debate is not over creation. The debate is over the existence of God. And that's where our secular world is going more and more and more and more. And I've got a young guy sitting back there just nodding. I hope he wasn't just hitting his chin, but he was nodding because he knows that's the debate among his peers. Is there a God? And if there's a God, then why? And you can fill in the blank on why. And Paul is helping us to do this with assurance from a sanctified point of view, from a Christian point of view. So God knows before. There was creation. And then in Isaiah chapter 42, those four servant passages in Isaiah, and this is one of them, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, my chosen one. In whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth justice or judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment or justice in the earth. And the isles shall wait for his law. In the foreknowledge of God, God chose Jesus, the second person of deity, to come into this earth and to die on the cross for our sins. To be buried and to be raised from the dead, to ascend into heaven And one day soon, in the consummation of the age, to wrap it all together, and we'll get to that point in just a moment, for all eternity. Jesus is the chosen one of God. 
He's the elect one of God. There is no election outside of Jesus. There is no salvation outside of Jesus. And when Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 1, and he talks here in Romans, and he talks other places about predestination and things uh, like that, he is talking about those who are chosen in Jesus are predestined, they are foreordained. It's as if God said, you give your life on the cross, and those who respond to you, those in the Old Testament prior to the cross, who respond to me in trust and in commitment, they will all be brought together as one people, the people of God, and they will have a choice with consequences. Now, my brother and sister, if you have no choice to choose Jesus, you also have no choice to reject Jesus. And Jesus himself said, whosoever will. He is dealing with one of the greatest theologians of his day in John chapter 3, a man by the name of Nicodemus. And whether this is John's summary statement or whether this is John quoting Jesus, scholars differ on it. It really doesn't matter. But verse 16 uh, says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. No salvation outside of Jesus. He that believes on Him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds shall be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Remember that first chapter of Romans? You wonder what happens to the pagan out here? I believe that John is telling us the words of Jesus in that passage to say that if anyone wants to know God, if they're sincere in their heart about finding this God, this great spirit the Native Americans referred to or whatever, God will so order things in their life in His purpose that they have an opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus. We sat I think it's the summit. Maybe it may, no, it wasn't. It was the old Astrodome in 1979. Cheryl and I went to Southern Baptist Convention and on missions night, my goodness, in those days, missions night was something else. Billy Graham was going to speak, but each, uh, each board chairman, uh, home mission board at the time, and then the foreign mission board, as it was called then, would give their reports. This was the days of Jimmy Carter's presidency. Human rights was really big. Baker James Cawthon stood and in his 15-minute report preached one of the greatest missionary messages I've ever heard. And all I remember seeing from where Cheryl and I were sitting was that little white head of hair on that platform and that finger waving in the sky and him saying, ladies and gentlemen, the most basic human right of every person on the face of the globe is to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in their language and have an opportunity to say yes. And that's never gotten out of my heart. That is the most basic of God's gifts to humanity. And we're the ones that are called to go share it. Paul is saying to us here that we have been chosen and we're chosen in Christ. And we are the firstborn among many brethren and we're chosen, we're predestined. God's purpose for us from the foundation of the earth is that you and I look like Jesus. That's sanctification. There was an old pastor, shade tree bivocational preacher in East Tennessee, and he stuttered. And in his stutter, he always would go, and, 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 and. and men would make fun of him. My dad told the joke, came in from the coal mines one day, 
and, and said these guys were just riding him heavy because of his stuttering. And uh, they made fun of him because he was a Pentecostal preacher. And they looked at him, you know, and he looked at them that morning and he said, and, 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 and you, 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 you fellas need to let me alone today. I'm not as close to Jesus as I was yesterday. That's sort of true of all of us from time to time, isn't it? It absolutely is. Listen to what Paul says, God's purpose. God foreordained this from the foundation of the earth before any of us were ever here, before the earth was ever created. This is God's purpose for us. He calls us. He calls us. There was a time when the Holy Spirit knocked at your heart's door. And you may have said no many times, but there was a time if you're born again, you said yes. We're the called of God. Every one of us are called to God. We talk about being called to a particular ministry, whether it's preaching or something else. And, and really, uh, there's less of that language in the Bible than there is the language that everyone who knows Christ, the Holy Spirit calls us. He bids us come. Jesus would say to the people on earth when he was here, follow me. And he would turn around and start walking, and they had to determine if they're going to follow him or not. And when he gave the demands of discipleship to one crowd, many of them turned and followed him no more. And he looked at the disciples, and he said, will you also go away? And oh my goodness, don't you love Simon Peter? He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's it, folks. That's it for us as individuals. That's it for us as a church. To embrace the Lord Jesus and to follow him, we are called to God, and he assigns us out of that. And those he calls, he justifies. He makes us right. Remember the old Microsoft Office documents and everything like that? You still got them on other uh, computers and things like that. But you know what a justified margin is. It's that margin where everything is just in order. That's what God did with our life through Jesus. When we said yes to Jesus, when we sensed the call of the Holy Spirit to our life, and we said yes to Jesus, in God's eyes, we were aligned with Him. For all eternity. And then he moves on and he says, and those he justified, he glorified. Now, you want to know how wonderful this is? There are four steps here. We're predestined, we're called, we're justified, and we're glorified. And God foreknew every bit of this. He knew we would be called to Jesus he knew we would respond. He would justify us. He would glorify us. You know what's really great about that? When you look at the Greek text of the New Testament, and I tell you again, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I read those who are. When you look at the Greek text of the New Testament, Every one of these words, every one of these concepts are in the aorist tense. A-O-R-I-S-T. That aorist tense means that it happened in the past and the results continue through infinity. Folks, grasp this. Before this world was ever created, before you and I were ever born, way back there, before anything, we don't know how long ago it was because God is present. We're bound to time. But in God's presence, He said, Give you a life, and I'll give you a people. I'll raise you from the dead, and I will choose and predestinate that they be conformed to your image and I will call them 
and I will justify them and align their lives with ourselves. And I will glorify them before the end of the age, and I will do all of that before they're ever born as if it were immediate and effective right now. You don't have to wait to be glorified. You've already been glorified. You don't have to wait to be called. You've already been called. You don't have to wait to be justified. You've already been justified. Thank God for what you have and stop worrying about this world. It's not a runaway world. God is in control. Yes, bad things are happening. But God is in control. And if I didn't believe God, God was sovereign and God was in control of the affairs of men, I'd lay this Bible aside and I would walk out the door and I would never preach another sermon. But I so believe what God has revealed in His Word is truth that I'm willing to give my life to Jesus to do what He wants me to do. Because, bless God, I've been predestinated. I've been called. I've been justified. I've been glorified. And one day these eyes will behold it and see it in the spiritual, in a resurrected body. But today, in this body, in this situation, I'm going to believe the truth of God's Word and act on it and live by it so long as He gives me breath. That's assurance. That's hope. That's peace. And you know something? That means you and I are in God's story. When I read this, I don't have to read about this document Paul wrote in the first century and sent it to these folks at Rome. And man, that was great for them. No, that's for old Ted right here in Harlingen, Texas. And that's for you right here in Harlingen, Texas. Yeah, we live in a part of the world that a lot of people don't pay much attention to. but God does. So what do I care what Wall Street thinks of us when God has told me what He thinks of us? Wall Street goes away. Jesus, we're in God's story. And the very last thing before we take the Lord's Supper, folks, that means we've got to persevere. We've got to persevere. The saints of God will persevere. People that drop by the wayside, they may be good friends of yours. They may be good friends of mine. I've had some of them. I've wept over some. Breaks your heart. Some drop aside from the church. Some drop aside um, for various reasons, maybe legitimate, maybe not. Most of them drop away because they didn't get their way. Or the Spirit got so convicting, they eased out. I knew one young evangelist at First Baptist Eulis that got so angry with God because he wasn't getting the revival meetings he thought he should be getting. He sat in a fireplace in the winter months and ripped his Bible from page to page and threw it in the fireplace and burned it. And it was dumb enough to brag about it. And I knew him and loved him. And I, I told my pastor, I said, well... I said, you know, I said, I guess I've felt that way sometimes myself. And he looked at me and he said, but you didn't burn your Bible. And see, some of you have been to the lowest of depths, but you didn't burn your Bible. You crawled, you limped, you gimped, you walked, you did it all. Until you could stand upright and even with pain in your heart and disappointment and loss in your background, it may be personal sin. I don't know. But those, oh, I wish we could do that over moments. You didn't burn your Bible. You kept going. That's perseverance. That's perseverance. That's the Holy Spirit leading you. Be encouraged. Be assured. We persevere. Go back to another 
story a long time ago. There were a whole bunch of us evangelists at First Baptist Shieldless, and I'm not going to call any names uh, because I may have one or two friends that actually look at this video. So I've got to be careful. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, we had one guy. Uh, Cheryl and I thought we had a hard time, but this family, they couldn't pay their light bill. They never complained. They had a daughter that was a senior in high school, Trinity High School. There was some kind of prize. Those parents couldn't have put that daughter, they couldn't have even taken her to a college campus, much less paid her tuition. And Cheryl, I don't recall the prize or the amount, but it was a cash award to be applied, and she won it. Had no idea that she was going to win that. In fact, it wasn't even with the school. It was outside the school. And that organization had a newspaper reporter, and they put a microphone in her face, called her name, and said, what are you going to do with this money? And she said, the first thing I'm going to do is tithe to my church. And I'm going to put the rest on my education. God's people persevere. Would you bow your head with me, please? Today's not tomorrow. It wasn't for this young woman. Today was very tough for her and her family, but God had a better tomorrow. And he does for you. We have been called. We have been justified. We have been glorified. If you know Jesus. But if you've not trusted Jesus, today is the opportunity to do it. I'm going to do something. I want you just to listen. This is going to be a little longer than normal, but we're getting ready in a few moments, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, what we call the Lord's Supper. This supper is a memorial meal. We remember. We remember what Jesus has done for us. And we're called as believers to approach Him in holiness. And so if you're a believer here this morning, I want to read the Scripture and as you listen, again, I want your heads bowed. I just want you to hear this as if you and I were sitting together. Paul wrote in chapter 11, For I received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that means in disrespect, dishonor of the Lord, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves... We should not be judged. There is a stern warning to the believer that disrespects the body, not only the body of the Lord Jesus, but the corporate body of brothers and sisters. What we do has an effect on one another. So if you're in this room and there are things in your life you need to confess and ask 
God to forgive you. Take this time during this invitation and do that. Get your heart right with God. He stands waiting to forgive. If you're in this room and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity so that you can take this supper with us. And if you don't know Jesus, if you've never trusted Him, it doesn't matter who you are, we ask you to refrain from participating in the Lord's Supper because you have nothing to remember until you trust Jesus. But in His name, I offer you a path to trust Him. And if you're willing to give Him your life just where you sit, say it like this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I cannot forgive myself. So I pray right now and ask that you would forgive my sin. Accept me as your child and help me live for you. I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead. And with my mouth, I will tell others that you are my Lord and I follow you.